the news agents. We identified them uh, two days ago, and they, the two, two of the three women were arrested. As you say, they had pictures of the um, uh, paragliding um, terrorists on their back. Um, my team and CPS worked flat out for 36 hours because um, we want to get it to charge. But it's a terrorism offence. It's terrorism supporting offense. a prescribed organisation. It's supporting Hamas. CPS and my team have worked flat out, and yet... Um, the Attorney General's office tells us they need two to four weeks to consider the paperwork. So we have to bail those two women. So if we're going to have the precise impact on the people who are really toxic, we need a system that follows through behind it. That's Sir Mark Rowley, the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Britain's top cop, who has come in for a lot of criticism from within government over not doing enough over these pro-Palestinian protests. His frustration is that they're doing their bit is the rest of the criminal justice system isn't doing theirs. Today, we have an extended interview where we ask him about how those protests are being policed, why we've seen police taking down posters of kidnapped victims, and what his response is to Suella's hate march. We're going to be hearing from him and more. Welcome to the News Agents. It's John. It's Emily. And later on in the podcast, once we've spoken to Sir Mark, we'll be going back over uh, yesterday's problem that we had with one particular word, what its meaning and what its origin was. Yes, f gate. But we're going to start, I guess, on the streets of London and the job that the police are facing, whether they're making the right calls, whether they're coming under pressure from the government, whether they think... The laws need to change to enable them to do their own jobs better. And six months ago, when Mark Rowley was last speaking to us, he talked about rooting out the bad apples in the police and trying to win back public trust. And I guess this is a chance for us to hear his views on whether that's actually happening now fast enough. Sir Mark Rowley, welcome. Thank you very much for coming back to see us at the News Agent. Good to see you again. It's an enormously challenging time for the police. And I want to start off with some of the detailed things that are happening at the moment, which seem, you know, a lot of people are going to find disturbing or upsetting or whatever. Mm. Liverpool Street Station last night, there was a big protest of pro-Palestinian groups on the concourse as people are trying to get home. Um, shouldn't those demonstrations have been broken up because people just want to travel freely? So... Um, British Transport Police colleagues assessed it and their view was people still could travel freely. So that's why um, they allowed it to continue, is my understanding. I think if we just zoom out a moment, though, um, John, this is an unprecedented moment. We haven't before had a situation where you've got state-related threats, the activity of the Iranians and the understandable sort of horror and upset across communities, particularly in Jewish communities. And I can't put myself in, in their shoes, but it, it's just horrific to see that and then to see a spike in sort of um, hate crime, which is a, in London, sort of maybe 14 fold. And then sort of on top of that, the sort of anxiety of people who are worried about humanitarian issues in in Gaza and sort of rising anti-Muslim hate crime are threefold. There isn't an easy way through this. And we're about sort of what are the facts, what are the truth, what the parliament decided the law is, and we'll enforce that. But lots of people aren't interested. Lots of sure. people want to cause tension they want to or they're chasing their own notoriety or they're trying to create tension and that means that these events don't get presented sensibly i know you're trying to react very sensitively to the demands of every community but i mean i just you know and i know that it was british transport police and not the metropolitan police that was dealing with the situation in, in liverpool street last night but if you're jewish and maybe you wear a skull cap or whatever it's going to be pretty intimidating yeah. isn't it to walk across that concourse and find your way to the tube or find your way to the mainline station uh, protest can be upsetting can be heretical um, can be distressing that doesn't make it illegal and we're constantly balancing is this crossing crossing the lines of the law um, and there's a balance between sort of where it is so a protest that is appropriate in the more sort of shared public space like a station or in Whitehall wouldn't be appropriate maybe outside a mosque or a synagogue depending on the nature of that protest so we're constantly trying to wrestle with the balance of those issues this isn't my i'm not putting a sort of personal moral judgment and my command team doing it it's not moral judgments it's not personal judgments it's what does the law say and where are people going too far um because our law creates a very wide leeway for right to protest and the times we can intercept in that are very narrow they're based on sort of sort of threats 
um, harassment, um, uh, provocation of violence, those sorts of issues, they're not based on th- whether things are, are distasteful. It's really, really difficult. And when you're talking to individual communities, and you, yes. you mentioned that anti-Semitic uh, attacks were up 1,400 uh, times in, yeah. in London, would you be advising um, Jewish people not to wear visible signs of their religion at this point? Would you be saying, is that a conversation you're having that you might, I mean, they're having it, many of them within their own communities. I know, and some are making that personal judgment, which really, it really upsets me as a sort of Londoner, an adopted Londoner, I've lived in London 25 years, that in this sort of fantastic global city that people feel like that, it upsets me that the events and the context in London is creating that. Um, We would never advise that, we will do everything we can do to keep people um, safe and to feeling safe but um, in the heat of this moment and with that rise in hate crime and with the sort of trauma that it's going to create being from the Jewish community when you've seen the um, horrific events in terms of the attack on Israelis all of that together it's completely understandable I mean my teams we're doing extra patrols in in communities particularly in Jewish communities um, uh, for most of the last three weeks we've managed to visit sort of pretty much nearly nearly every synagogue every day there's been a whole load of work going on in terms of reassurance trying to spot crime we've arrested 70 or 80 people for hate crimes again most of those will be against Jewish communities we- a chunk will be against Muslim communities so we're doing everything we can do on it that's not to pretend it's not there because clearly it is so Mark, you've explained that a lot comes down to nuance and context, but there are certain things going on in these protests. One, as we've covered, the shouting of jihad. There's this other phrase from the river to the sea. I'd love to know your thoughts on whether that should be a banned phrase in these protests. We saw on one of the early protests a couple of women who were trying to emulate the Hamas terrorists as paragliders in stickers on their back. What happened to them? Yeah, that's ghastly, isn't it, the last one? It's, across, it's definitely across the line, in my view. Um, we've been trying to identify them. We identified them uh, two days ago, and they, the t- two of the three women were arrested. For, as you say, they had pictures of the um, uh, paragliding um, terrorists on their back. Um, my team and CPS worked flat out for 36 hours because um, we wanted to get it to charge. So, because we, that would be a hate crime. It's a terrorism offence. It's terrorism supporting offense. a prescribed organisation. It's supporting Hamas, I, 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 I think, and that's what we're suggesting. CPS and my team have worked flat out, and yet... Um, the Attorney General's office tells us they need two to four weeks to consider the paperwork. So we have to bail those two women. So if we're going to have the precise impact on the people who are really toxic, we need a system that follows through behind it. So those and women are now free to go on the next week's marches and the week after and the week after. Bail conditions on and try and enforce that. But it would be much better if we could follow the case straight through. And frankly, the way the court system is working at the moment, if they are charged... Um, they'll probably be on trial sometime in 2025 or maybe even later. Two years? Yeah. So what you're saying is it's not working. Even if you arrest people, so we're, it's not working. We're at the front end of a system which is clogged and slow and it needs to move better. And that also kind of feeds into some of the criticism that there has been from government about the police. Look, you, what you're saying is, look, we're doing our best. It needs the rest of the machine to do it. Yeah, so we're doing our best. Of course, that you from time to time, there are things we could do better, but it's a whole system that's determined and sees this what, what this is. This is a sort of uh, once in decades moment when the whole system needs to work together because whilst we might not agree on every case that is perhaps inflammatory, but it's not across the line of the law, the ones that are across the line of the law, we need to be able to be precise and assertive as quickly as possible. And that's what I'm trying to deliver. And that's what we need to do better across the whole system. We've seen some police officers taking down posters of kidnapped victims, British citizens being held hostage in a foreign country. What was that about? I've got sort of tens of thousands of good men and women going out every day trying to maintain peace. That's the job of the police. And a simple example, um, we've seen cases in recent, in the last couple of weeks, officers taking um, Palestinian flags away from a Jewish war memorial, Jewish cemetery, and then on the other hand, officers taking Jewish posters um, off the um, shutters of a shop where there'd be Palestinians. In both cases, they're just trying to deflame tension, and yet you generate this massive hostility that the police are somehow partisan. We're constantly trying to deflame tension. Let's have a listen to Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary, who has kind of made her own intervention on this, and what she feels about the marches that have been taking place the last couple of Saturdays in central London. To my mind, there's only one way to describe those marches. They are hate marches. 
Now, secondly, the police and the, crime, uh, the, the Crown Prosecution Service are operationally independent, so it's not for me to provide a running commentary on the specific legal decisions that they are making in real time on the ground. But what the police have made clear is that they are concerned that there's a large number of bad actors who are deliberately operating beneath the criminal... What is um, a hate march? Yeah. You'd have to ask the Home Secretary that. I mean, she's picked two words out of the English language and strung them together in a way. That's that's something that she's talking about. I don't know whether she means everybody there or some of the people there. That's not for me. Um, I'm held to account by politicians. I don't hold them to account. Was it unhelpful? We've, we've seen... Say, I don't hold them to account. <laughs> well, that we, sounds we, like a yes, it was unhelpful, uh, given what you just we described as your uh, job. We don't hold them to account. So on these protests, there are people there for a range of reasons. There's people there just concerned about humanitarian issues of people there who are anti-war and, and but this hasn't and, come out of nowhere she said hate marches because we saw a week earlier her question why you hadn't arrested more people um in the crowds some of whom were shouting jihad some of whom were in her words provoking anti-semitic um chants and and, and responses there yeah so many people will make their own sort of moral judgments and i need to be really clear we're not saying that we think as police everything is necessarily tasteful or proper or the best way of behaving that's not our job our job is is it illegal okay so and let's so just that, deal that's, with that's that the, that's the fundamental issue it's not illegal to shout jihad even if you are from his butcheria an organization which we know wants the end of the israeli state so this is going to be difficult but most of these situations depend completely on context there are some things you could say that are completely unequivocal that would um i don't know be sort of threatening hate crime or might amount to supporting a terrorist organization um so you could say some things in support of hamas which were very explicit um and are clearly across the legal line um a lot of language has more than one interpretation and so it depends on context we have to prove beyond all reasonable doubt um, so if you're inferring that... Well, even if it's his butcheria. I mean, well, so, know, his butcheria probably aren't going around thinking about their own spiritual well-being. Right? Um, they're, they're, not, they're not a group that most people would sort of support their objectives. Um, and they're prescribed they're, in most other countries. They're prescribed in Germany and sort of most of the Muslim-led countries. They're, they're banned in as well. Um, uh, governments over the last 20 years have looked here at whether our law allows them to ban them and it doesn't so they are a legal organisation that's not a legal organisation that's not my decision and this was a protest that its explicit purpose was to march from Turkish embassy to Egyptian embassy and call on those Muslim countries to take part in the conflict and mm. protect um, Palestine now um, whether that's something we would want or not want it's not illegal to have that to make that I, point. I, no, hang on, let me finish. Yeah, sure. But could there well be people within that march who mean other things by what they're saying and when they're talking about that? Yes, there could be. To prosecute people for um, supporting a ter terrorist organisation or encouraging terrorism or encouraging hate crime, it comes to their intent. Proving their intent in that situation, neither we nor CPS felt there was any prospect of doing that. But that doesn't mean that we're pretending it's not inflaming and upsetting. No. So does the law need to be changed then? You're saying, look, we, we're just trying to operate the laws as they currently stand. We can't just do things off our own bat, willy-nilly. Context, yes, is important, but it's the law of the land that we're enforcing. Do you need more help? So Parliament draws the line, we enforce the line. Um, they've been On this subject, there have been several reports over the last four or five years suggesting the line might not be in the right place. There have been two inquests that have made such recommendations. The inquest for the 2017 London Bridge attack made some recommendations. Um, Sir John Saunders' um, inquiry into the Manchester bombings made some um, comments and recommendations. Um, there's a report by the Counter Extremism Commission a few years ago which I was involved with and the Law Commission have reported on hate crime and why they don't think those laws work. So there's quite a lot of people saying actually that some of these lines aren't in the right place. And so Mark, that, what I, do you think? Well, I was involved in a report which says they weren't in the right place. So, so you, you still think the laws need but, to change? But I sort of, I, I, government may or may not be able to do that, at this, but sort of frankly today, I, I need to focus on our tactics. Now our tactics, every week we'll sort of 
develop our tactics this weekend. We've got some um, new tactics for the protest that we expect this weekend, and I think there'll be another big one the following weekend. Um, what does that mean? So we've got some options. We're going to um, we're starting to use sort of looking how we can use technology to help us more. So our um, use of sort of social media analytics, um, our use of um, uh, retrospective facial recognition to identify people who are behaving badly very quickly. That's not live filming, but that's um, rapid investigative tactics. So we're doing a range of things to um, try and get sharper at identifying the troublemakers in the crowd, because there will be troublemakers, we're not pretending there aren't. And secondly, um, uh, deploying some different tactics so we can make sharper interventions to make arrests in big crowds. But just to go back one second, Rishi Sunak has said that no laws need to change. Is he right? He's the Prime Minister. It's for the government and Parliament to decide on the law. I mean, you so said two years ago, we need a better legal structure to combat extremism. I'd be surprised if in the job you're in now, you've suddenly changed your mind on that. I was writing that report from outside policing. That was my view. Um, whether it's still my view or not, of course, it, it's, it, it is, but it's not relevant. Parliament sets the law. I'm here today to the police, to the current line of the law, and we're doing everything possible because um, this is going to keep rolling and we are going to do everything we possibly can do to take the dangerous people off the street who break the law. We will keep doing that. Um, we'll keep chasing people down. We'll look at new tactics. That's our, that's our job. But we can't enforce taste and decency. That's not our job. And the reason for coming on a show like this is to try and have a chance to talk about it in longer form and also to make the point, and it's a sort of a fool's appeal, but um, the more balance we can have in public debate, the better. Because unbalanced public debate will drive division and tension which is stoking problems that none of us want in our communities. The way you've focused it so far has been very much on the threat of civil disorder and community relations. How concerned are you about an uptick in terrorist activity uh, where groups may be thinking, this is our moment? So I do have some concerns. I think at the moment, our threat level in the UK is a substantial, which is an attack is likely. That's sort of towards the lower end of where it's been for the last 10 or so years. The next level up would be uh, uh, severe. So have, have you foiled more attacks in recent weeks? Um, so uh, I haven't got those numbers to pluck out. There's a constant effort to sort of to deal with attacks. The number of terrorism investigations. Um, there's uh, the, the colleague of mine leads on terrorism work for the country, um, Matt Dukes. I think there's sort of 800 investigations. There's sort of about 500 of them relate to sort of Islamist terrorism. But has that grown uh, so since October the 7th? And there are more cases coming in, for example, some of the online material. So they've, some of the sort of really toxic concerning online material that is potentially breaching terrorism offences, um, they're approaching 2,000 referrals of which they've sifted and it's a sort of around 250 that um, potentially cross terrorism boundaries and are requiring further investigation. So you can see the caseload is building. Mm. Um, we have to be extra attuned to the prospect that some of those extremists will be provoked into action. So th th that's part of the say we talk about hostile state activity, terrorist activity, protest, hate crime, community well, tension. What about it's the overlay figures? of those issues. Can is I tension. ask you, I mean, yesterday we saw Keir Starmer finish making a speech and there were protests as soon as he left the building. The police were on hand yes. straight away. A month earlier, he was at his own conference where, you know, he was uh, sort of attacked on the stage. That time it was only glitter, but we're living in an era where we've seen mm. the deaths of, of two MPs in the last eight years or so. I mean, did, when you were watching that, presumably you, you, were, you saw that or you, you heard about it pretty quickly, you know, did your heart sink? So in terms of the security issues, of course, we're constantly sort of trying to balance security in terms of um, uh, public figures want, they want to be able to meet constituents, constituents they want to be visible, um, they don't want a sort of security around them that makes them distant. Um, and we're trying to balance how to do that the whole time. We're constantly reviewing those tactics and sort of learning from those different situations. But it goes to that point earlier, doesn't it, about everything getting more more febrile and aggressive. And whether people sort of agree or disagree with Keir Starmer clearly isn't my isn't my business. But um, but a breach but, of security but, is. But, but but sort of when things become sort of heated and potential breach of security, of course it is. And we're constantly resting with how much security we put there. Putting a permanent phalanx around sort of any politician isn't what any of them would want. And we're constantly sort of reviewing the levels. There's an independent government committee called um, RAVEC, um, uh, Royal and VIP Executive Committee, I think it was, that stands for or something like that, which is constantly about reviewing the levels. And they set the level of protection that we then deliver for but, various... But might it be fair to uh, conclude that since October the 7th, 
it, that might be needed to be stepped up. We don't talk about the exact levels, but it's constantly under review. So, Mark, we're going to take a pause there. We'll be back with more of the Thank Metropolitan you. Police Commissioner after the break. And we're back with uh, Sir Mark Reddy, um, the Metropolitan Police Commissioner. Sir Mark, we were just discussing in the first half of the podcast the, the enormous pressure that the Metropolitan Police is under over the kind of situation in Israel, Gaza. On top of this, we now have the government saying you've got to deal with shoplifting, XL bully dogs, smoking bans where shops are no longer able to sell packets of cigarettes. Can you do everything? that is being asked of you? Or is it almost like you're being set up to fail? The list does potentially get longer. We're also doing things to try and focus, just to give you some sort of, just to give you some numbers. Every week, um, we're, uh, we're sort of, I think, getting up sort of 20,000 calls. We're attending sort of thousands of incidents. We're making a couple of thousand, um, uh, uh, a couple of thousand arrests. Um, we, I think, dealing every day with something like 150 missing people. I mean, there's, there's so much sort of heat in the system. Um, talking today is timely. Today we're going live with a changed approach on mental health, where we're being much more clear about. We will go to incidents where there is a policing purpose, e.g., because someone's being violent. We're not going to act as a backfill for mental health services. What, what about don't if have somebody the calls you because they think that their relative, their friend, is in danger of, of taking their own life? Would you go to that call? Um, if there's not a threat to anybody else, then it's not a it's not a police, policing purpose. Then it needs to be a mental health professional who goes to it. So that's for the ambulance service and the health service, and that's what we've been working through with them in terms of their protocols. So someone gets the right support in that moment. So if they call nine 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 and say, "I'm watching somebody on I don't know Westminster Bridge, and it looks like they're about to," oh, so, clearly, so so in, in terms of situations requiring sort of where the, there's that immediate risk to life and a need for a negotiator, then we, we have established ways of working with the ambulance you services on that. Yes, we would. Likewise, so if someone's threatening somebody, we will still. Um, um, go to that situation but what has happened over the years is a whole range of sort of um, social care mental health cases um, others have stepped back and police have filled it and actually it's it's not just about the fact that it means we're not doing police work because we're doing that it's the wrong care if I had a member of my family in mental health crisis I'd want a medical professional dealing with them not a police officer however caring and sort of determined they would be in terms of doing a but good job but you can't get those either um, I mean, quite frankly you know you can't get a medical professional to respond but, to a mental health um, call but, it was, but also it leads to the criminalisation of people in this area because if a police officer turns up you can generate conflict where there wasn't any it, if there's someone in a mental health crisis so we're not the right answer yeah sure but let me so, see you back to the original so question which is what, well no which so, is so the, that's a way of easing the pressure of course of course yes it is but do you feel that kind of what you know, you listen to Rishi Sunak delivering his conference speech and you think, God, we're going to have to be responsible now for whether, you know, Mrs. Miggins in the local shop is selling cigarettes to 14 year olds or not, because we've already been hit over the head. We're not doing enough about shoplifters. I just wonder whether you get these endless sort of press releases from government. and You think, please, how are we meant to deal with that? Um, we have far more potential work than we have resources to deal with. That is clearly true. We prioritise based on the risk to people, the danger, the seriousness of the offending, as you would um, as you, you sometimes would feel that ministers are setting the priority. They're saying, you've got to be doing much more about shoplifting. And, you know. uh, so the way my position works, I have operation independence. The mayor and the home secretary set priorities around policing and the legal phrases, I have to give them due regard. So I, I, that we don't ignore them, but we don't have to slavishly follow them either. And a lot of what we do is based on based on the risk that we see in front of us. Um, it can't simply be, um, and I don't think um, the mayor or the would expect. Well, they've said something, so we, we we're not going to deal with that stabbing because we're going to deal with that shoplifting. That's not I mean, what they expect at all. So, Mark, the, the big problem is recruitment, right? You, you told us, I think, when you talked to us in June. Um, that you won't get smaller if you, you know, root out all the bad apples, all the people that are doing terrible things in the force, which I know is one of your primary concerns. But frankly, a month ago, on September the 6th, you told uh, the authority, the London authorities, the Police and Crime Committee, that the police are losing more than they're recruiting, that you're unable yes, to get your numbers so up. There's a budget issue and there's a recruiting issue. So just to the, the, the stretch issue, we are policing London today with 28% less money in real terms per head of population than we had a decade ago. 28% less real terms per capita to police London. So that requires tougher operational choices day in and day out. Um, and on top of that, um, 
the London employment market is red hot. Um, Come on, though. It's not just about the red hot market. I mean, let me finish my sentence, please, Emily. (laughs) The London employment market is red hot. And also, we have some challenges because of our reputation, the combinations, it's hard to recruit. The reason I make the point about the employment market, um, there are other agencies in enforcement and intelligence in London who have the same recruitment problem. So it is it is not just a metropolitan police issue, which is why I say it's it's, it's a much wider issue about um, the challenges of recruiting in that in that context. But the effect is of our 30, sort of five and a half thousand officers, roughly strength by the sort of end of this year, um, end of this business year, so 1st of April, we're going to be somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 short. And that's clearly deep concern. So that takes you into even deeper prioritisation um, choices. And one of the other things that you said to us when you spoke to us in June was your impatience that came across about how long it was taking to get rid of people you thought were yeah. bad apples or bad actors or however, however you want to phrase it. Yeah, you said you had 500 that were on restricted duty and several hundred that were suspended. You told us that back in June. Yeah, have they right. gone now? Um, some of them have. Some of them. Uh, some of them still haven't. The um, government have agreed to change the regulations in relation to that, and they're doing the final bits of work on that. And um, I'm hoping those new regulations will be in place before Christmas, and then we can get rolling with a different approach in in the new year. Um, I mean, so got, it will I accelerate. Know, <laughs> so it will accelerate your ability accelerate to ability get to sort of. And, and so, so we we are dealing with them faster than ever before. Um, there's a frankly there's a blockage building in the pipe because of the way the regulations operate um, and um, I spoke about this publicly on the policing board a couple two or three weeks ago and we're optimistic that with the regulations and new approaches we can get through the numbers very but quickly. But you could be but getting I, rid of uh, several hundred and as you've said you're finding it very difficult right now for, for myriad reasons mm. to recruit. This force is getting smaller at a time when you are now even more worried about the amount of policing and about the atmosphere, potentially yeah. very so that, explosive atmosphere that we're now living in. That is absolutely true. And, and um, I think it's important to, to, to make the point of balance. The majority, I've got tens of thousands of officers who come into work day in and day out, um, 10,000 police staff as well, who desperately care about doing a good job for London. And they find that increasingly hard in this febrile environment and they need the public support and encouragement as much as sort of the public are going to expect me to sort out the issues that have undermined sort of confidence in our integrity. Like the guys uh, who pulled over uh, Bianca Williams and Ricardo de Santos who then got fired and then we saw a fundraising crowd by their colleagues to raise money for fired officers. What was that about? So uh, there's I mean that's a, that's a whole sort of longer conversation. Um, we're waiting. I think today or tomorrow, t- tomorrow or the next day, I think we'll see the explanation of the decision of the panel, which will be helpful. There may be appeals. I mean, fundamentally, if two officers have lied, then they shouldn't be in the pl- in the police service. Um, but full does stop. it talk to you about the culture? If there is a sense of a, a protection racket coming around the very officers who are being fired. So I, I think. Um, some people so I think some people are confused because um, we haven't yet got the decision of the panel in full detail Um, four officers said they um, smelt cannabis and the panel decided two of them were telling the truth and two were lying Um, and two sort of those two have been sacked so that's I think caused some of the confusion Um, um, the IOPC put out a grossly misleading statement on the back of the hearing so there's a range of factors in there which 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 haven't helped it but fundamentally um, uh, if officers have lied, of course they shouldn't be in the job. Meanwhile, you've got tens of thousands of officers who are just trying to go- do a good job in this really contentious space. So those those officers that get this public attention because they're sensibly taking a Palestinian flag from a Jewish memorial or taking some of those um, sort of um, uh, Jewish sort of appeal um, posters off the, um, the off the off the off the shop, which is linked to some people who are pro-Palestinian. Those officers are going out doing practical things to try and de- um, reduce tension. And the world is leaping on top of them, and, so, and sort of in sort of anger and outrage. That is not going to help us police London successfully. That that's why I'm sat here because I want to make that point about we need to come together in this difficult moment, regardless of different opinions, rather than um, having this determination to stoke tension. M- Mark, just before we let you go, and I know um, you've been very generous with your time. We've been watching over the last few days the COVID inquiry. Um, hearing today from the Deputy Cabinet Secretary that not a single day passed 
when Downing Street, when, when the heart of government was following the COVID rules, given how many of these COVID cases are still going through the courts, people who've been, you know, pulled up for small breaches of COVID rules, would you like to see an amnesty now? I mean, would that be helpful? Oh, well, we, we, we haven't got any major cases at the moment that we're investigating. Um, it's If you look at it in terms of severity, in terms of breach of the law, um, it's not the most severe, severe thing. We've got people sort of stabbing each other and using firearms. We had we seized 20 firearms in an operation last night. Um, we've got more serious things so to deal with. So wouldn't you like these cases to be um, kicked out? Well, they, they need to go through the court. There will occasionally be cases which have so many aggravating features, as some of the recent ones do, that they merit investigation. But we're not going to spend any more time on that than we need to because we've got to deal with those firearms crimes. I mean, every day we're sort of disrupting eight organised crime groups in London. Mm. Um, there's, a, I know, 100 stop and searches in London every day that are producing positive results that are keeping communities safe. We've got to keep doing all of that work and chasing back on these old issues don't matter. The other thing you said to us when you came in in June was that your essentially your central priority was restoring public trust. You're describing the unique challenges you're facing now. Are you getting there? It stopped falling. It's going to take some time to build, frankly. Um, I'm, I'm, you don't move trust very quickly, and particularly in this contended space where everyone's got their own opinion of what good men and women are doing on the streets day in and day out. So not really. So not really. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Yesterday, we obviously covered in some detail what had been happening at the COVID inquiry. It has been going on today, not quite as many swear words, but a few uh, nonetheless. Uh, this is the counsel for the inquiry reading out a memo from Helen McNamara, who was then the deputy cabinet secretary when she realised just how dire the situation was with COVID. You expressed your view that I have come through here to the Prime Minister's office to tell you all I think we're absolutely fucked. I think this country is heading for a disaster. I think we're going to kill thousands of people. As soon as I've been told this, I've come through to see you. It seems from the conversation you're having that that is correct. Um, give or take a few words, is it right that that's an accurate account? Yes. It's very striking. Yes. Um, no doubt you can still remember um, that moment of realisation. Yes, it was, it was horrible. It's such a different tone to the one that we heard yesterday or to the couple that we heard yesterday from the woman who suddenly realised what was careering towards them and was trying to do her level best to warn the Prime Minister. And she went on to say there was increasing concern that we were radically in the wrong place. It was a sense of foreboding. And I hope nobody sitting in that office ever has it again. A very, very scary experience. And what she describes, and I think this is uh, the, the tenor more widely of what we heard today, is, frankly, a lot of the women in the office at the time being ignored, a lot of the junior members not being listened to, the kind of chieftains, the alpha males sort of railroading over what people in positions of significant knowledge were actually trying to tell them. And it kind of chimes, quite frankly, because I remember at the time watching the pictures coming out of Italy where those extraordinary scenes around the Colosseum or, you know, the Piazza di Spagna in Rome or the Vatican were absolutely empty. And on Newsnight, we did a split screen and we showed what it, what Italy was looking like and we showed everyone here going to the Cheltenham races, everyone here carrying on as normal. And it was that dislocation that I think a lot of us saw and that Helen McNamara clearly spelled out, which is... Why do you think we're immune to this? We're not going to be immune to it. Italy's not very far away, and this is what they're doing. Why aren't we taking it seriously? Uh, the other thing she was saying, which I thought, you know, just how jarring it was to listen to Boris Johnson being all breezy and optimistic, and I'm going to shake people's hands, and I'm going to carry on doing all the things that we already do, when they already knew yeah. that that was absolutely a foolish message to be giving the British public when what you're about to have to do is tell them their behaviour has to change in a fundamental way. 
And, it, and, and I think that that was kind of also striking. Yeah. I mean, yesterday we were talking more, to be fair, about the the internal political breakdown between those in charge, those who wanted to be in charge, those who didn't like what Cabinet was doing compared to those who didn't like what the political aides were doing. But also that extraordinarily revealing statement, which was that Boris Johnson basically thought that the people who would be dying from COVID would be dying anyway. So he wasn't going to get that concern about it. And that Absence of humanity is a phrase that recurred again today. And that was definitely part of Helen McNamara's um, testimony. And she was talking about the people who you don't often think about, but she felt it was her duty to remind the Prime Minister what happens to all those who are incarcerated, what happens to all those whose life is literally being sorted out by the state at a time of pandemic. And the kind of feedback was, oh, well, who cares? Now, yeah, maybe people care less about prisoners than about anyone else. But I think you also judge the civilization of a society. Maybe people care less about prisoners because they think that, you know, they've they've done what they deserve. But I think you also judge the civilization of a society on how it treats, you know, some of its offenders as well as how it treats its, its monarchs. And I think the point that comes through time and again in... McNamara's, Helen McNamara's testimony is this sense of, am I going to say it? Willy waving? Really? You know, just a lot of people kind of rushing around, thrashing around, thinking that they had it all sorted without actually asking the right questions or listening to the proper answers. Well, now that you've said willy waving, I think I'm going to try to perform an elegant ish turn into some of the (laughs) other (laughs) language. You know where this is going. We need to discuss Mm. the etymology. A big fancy word for this podcast. We need to discuss the etymology of Because if you were listening yesterday, uh, this is how Maitlis and I suddenly had to start the podcast. (laughs) It's John. It's Emily. And I think the giggles and the laughter is because we're reflecting on, frankly, Maitlis and I are used to salty language but we have been exposed to a whole new word and we shouldn't detain ourselves when there are really serious issues about what happened with covid but a f- i've never heard of that we're actually having an editorial discussion right now between the studio and the gallery about what one is and where it first came from i think i think we can safely say it might be a a, a dominic cummings copyright on that one Oh, but I think how I wrong think... we were. <laughs> yeah, and we you were told us <laughs> in your droves that it was nothing to do with Dominic Cummings and that it had preceded him by several decades, actually. But... We have been fielding messages all morning from many of you who are telling us, uh, sort of helping us with the intellectualisation of yeah. our etymology. So, so one of our regular guests on this podcast, Sir Craig Oliver, who was a former director of communications at number 10, uh, messages us both this morning to say uh, it was from last time tango in Paris and was spoken by Marlon Brando or probably mumbled by uh, Marlon Brando as was his want. We've also had all sorts of other. uh, It it was a Harold Pinter play from 1996 Ashes to Ashes. Uh, Rebecca played by Lindsay Duncan tells Devlin I think you're a f***. Okay I got this one first hand. Listen just write the article you four eyed f***. Charles Wilson, deputy editor of The Times <laughs> under Charles Douglas Hume, to bespectacled journalists across the newsroom desk in The Times offices in Gray's Inn Road. I think that's being put at around 1983. Yeah, well, we've also had uh, someone contact us saying it was from Psychoville when Steve Pemberton's character announced to a very confused murder mystery party that the murderer has written fuck pig on the wall in his or her own excrement. I mean, chronologically, I think Last Tango in Paris wins because it's 72, 73, yeah. early 70s. But there it was, was only... the X film when I was 13 or 14 that I was desperate <laughs> to get into. <laughs> well, we thought there was only one person that could really tell us where f- comes from. And that is none other than Susie Dent. Hi there, news agents. Susie here. Well, I guess my word of the day has to be fuck pig, which is defined in the Oxford English Dictionary as an unpleasant or contemptible person and is labelled as coarse slang. No surprise there. Um, you might think David Cameron, you might think that episode 
in Black Mirror, but actually our first record is from 1935 mm. and a work from T.E. Lawrence, Arabia. a.k.a. Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> um, it's a book called Mint in which he describes his life in the RAF and clearly someone was shouting, look at me, look me in the face, you short assed little fuck pig. Uh, and the word has been bobbing along happily since then and who knows, its latest outing might give it a little bit of a boost. I hope that helps. I feel better for that. I feel I feel happier that it's at least 100 years old. It's basically like a spinning jenny or a bobbin, isn't it? It has a little bit of antiquity to it. From these short ass little f***ers, <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 